And so the results were, I'm sad to report, I know I have to wrap up so I can get some questions in. Um, male investors did prefer male markets with men CEOs and female investors, and this I sent out to you know all, I tried to get an equal sample, very challenging to do, um, but I did, I got good numbers of female investors. Um, they did select female markets. And you might say then, well, is this really just about, you know, this is clear, you just said, it's what you know, right? And having your diverse perspective. Um, unfortunately, it's a little uh, worse than that because, you know, you see this and when you see the show Shark Tank, when you see it, even in India, I'm sure you will see the men investors say things like, or female too, right? But the men, if someone comes in with a handbag or with Spanx or with, you know, a female targeted business, they often say things like, I don't use it, I'm out, right? I'm not going to invest because I don't get it. I don't wear a handbag, so I don't see the market potential. But the question is, why should you? You shouldn't need to use a business in order to understand that there's a good financial return available to you. So um, yes, and, and, and Swati is confirming my comment here. They say that about cosmetics all the time. And cosmetics is an enormous industry, right? Huge, huge business. In fact, uh, recession resistant, right? Lipstick luxuries is what it's known as. It's a good market. Um, and there's a lot of science in it, right? In terms of thinking about the testing and development, et cetera. Anyway, so I'll get, I'll um, bring my bias here to the conversation. So I went further. And I said, what if Sarah Blakely had been this guy? And you may not know this guy, but this guy is actually a very successful entrepreneur, but um, I used him to come up with Seth Blakely, right? A, a Western white name. And what if he had started Spanx, a women market business, instead of being a white blonde woman, if it had been a white guy? And so the quote would be, I convinced all these men to make a product that women wear because sadly, and this is where it gets really depressing, my investors would prefer female markets if there was a man in the CEO position. And in fact, the, I had them fill out some you know, uh, questions about quality, right? Like why were you picking these businesses in this conjoint analysis? And the comment was the men focused, the female focused business with the male team, they were a great team. They were a great team, right? Really qualified, really great team. And so um, this guy, just so you know, is the um, person who started Dollar Shave Club, which has been also become a billion dollar business. It was acquired by, um, um, I think, I can't remember. Um, anyway, he, uh, it, terrible razors. He got a ton of venture capital funding um, and was acquired for a lot of money. Um, so, and I think women entrepreneurs tend to know this. This was a story in uh, a few years ago in Silicon Valley. These women entrepreneurs created a fake male co-founder to dodge startup sexism. Literally said their, uh, Unilever, thank you. I found out my, my acquirer. Um, so Penelope and Kate created a fake male CEO and they literally said his name was Keith Mann. So his name was Mr. Mann, which I think is hilarious. So their fake co-founder got a lot more respect and interest in their business. So as I mentioned, I think this is our big problem. Um, there's assumptions that we make that we can't help but make. This is uh, my work that this is in Harvard Business Review. Um, investors tend to punish entrepreneurs if they act feminine, right? If they act like women, because we have such a norm in entrepreneurship for entrepreneurs who are successful are men, right? Are white men. And women, if they act like men in other fields, and this is from the paper, um, tend to be discriminated against for being feminine because it may contradict our assumption of what the person should be, right? So in the US, we have, you know, we've had a long history of only men presidents. Um, India has actually had a woman president before the US, right? So the US has only had male presidents. So we 
we have this assumption that they should be a masculine norm. And that's where these gender role norms come in. And so there are fields like politics where if you act like a man to fit the role of the president, um, you still get bias against you because you're not acting feminine like the woman you are. And that turns out to be true in management as well, um, but not in entrepreneurship. So, you know, my net net is that when it comes to being um, an, you know, an entrepreneur that you have to like play the part. So, um, I mean, I can go on, but I think I will stop there because I realize I'm out of time. And I know you may have some questions. I'm seeing some pop up. So um, just so you know, I mean, I'll just very quickly share that I did do a study of successful entrepreneurs with Bank of America. And these are some of the findings that women entrepreneurs still face bias about businesses if they cater to women's markets even if they're successful, even if they're, you know, very, um, if they've been able to grow the business and they still face, you know, capital challenges. So I can stop and, uh, sorry, Professor Thalai, I don't know if you wanna take over or um, I know I'm, <laughs> I know I'm late. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, wonderful. Um, uh, you know, I, you know, very rarely one is engrossed, particularly on a <laughs> webinar. I even in the speaker exits time. So I was completely, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I kind of liked the, the various findings and the studies and the way you presented it more importantly. Um, so there are, uh, uh, there are several questions, uh, you know, that has come up and um, we probably will, you know, take a few questions. Um, you know, anybody who would like to raise your hand and give a question to the speaker, I, I welcome because you may want to like, uh, the, I'd like to ask a question uh, to the speaker directly. Uh, if you'd like to, please put up your hand and then, um, you know, a short introduction and then if you can make your question short. Hey, well, Tilly, can I ask? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, hi, hi, Lakshmi. Um, thanks for a wonderful presentation. I think these biases are there everywhere and I think you're bringing it up the, at the VC level, which is very critical for startups. Um, so I just have a question on the other kind of biases you mentioned on gender, but there are tons of biases that financial markets deal with, right? like laws aversion and so on. So do you find those as well in the VC community? Yeah, I mean, definitely, right? And I kind of alluded to some of that, the, you know, the crowd, kind of the lemming notion of, of following, you know, assumptions of, uh, you know, there, there's definitely all of these dynamics at play. What I studied was purely the behavioral, right? Just looking at these behaviors that were influencing the pitch decision. So I know there are broader, and that is certainly an area that I wanna move into, looking at these broader, you know, industry-wide pushes of, um, you know, following trends and, you know, and what's available, right? What information is, all of these things do, there are tons of cognitive biases that have been ignored, frankly, on um, in when it comes to these financial decisions. And they're starting to, um, you know, Robert Thaler, who won the Nobel Prize, right, for, for Nudge is, uh, is definitely, um, has crossed over into these, into these avenues of starting to look at how do we think about financial decision-making, recognizing that there are so many cognitive biases that you know makes this not a rational or you know objective process it's impossible it's impossible in my mind so and i i'm just showing you this from just this pitch moment right from this pitch analysis yeah. and and actually from just the assumptions of gender and how they're playing in our in our yeah. decision making so okay. just a comment lakshmi that um, yes. i had the incubator at im bangalore which is a management school. And we have about 70% of our startups are women startups. Wow. And, uh, and we actually do a pitch session for them of how to sort of groom them to, to be ready for these investors. So definitely some of these biases, we will put that into our program. Thanks yeah. a lot. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Vidula, would you like to ask your question? 
Um, thanks. Uh, thanks, Lakshmi, for the wonderful uh, talk. Um, so since my PhD, I've been working on women entrepreneurship. So it's very fascinating to see all of these different um, sort of perspectives that you've also brought to the table. Um, I was just wondering specifically uh, related to, say, the last two years, we hear a lot about uh, leaders being empathetic and uh, compassionate and so on, right? So uh, there's a significant shift towards sort of uh, adopting what would probably be called sort of feminine traits into leadership and such. So I was wondering if you have seen any such shift when you're looking at entrepreneurs as well uh, and entrepreneurship um, or qualities that you would require in an entrepreneur. Yeah, no, <laughs> is, a, is a short answer. Um, uh, you know, and this is where, and I, I, I'm just going to share one of the things that I, um, you know, this is what we've talked about. There's, there's so much data about diverse teams, right? And having different perspectives and that uh, in general, if we were to totally, you know, go on stereotypes for a moment, um, women are, have been shown to be much more collaborative when it mm. comes to decision-making and to, you know, to sharing and empathy and, and some of these feminine traits that you just mentioned and which are incredibly valuable for decision-making, particularly in team settings. And so, well, unfortunately, I think the, the notion that the entrepreneur as leader is so entrenched in our mind as this, you know, white male norm and some of the masculine stereotypes that are associated with that, that that is still not valued for sure in entrepreneurship. You want to see someone that is decisive and assertive and, you know, all of these sort of um, male traits, even though we know that doesn't, you know, and, and this is where, this is kind of the next phase of my work is going, you know, we have these assumptions of quality. So when I worked in VC, you know, if a person came in with projections that didn't show a billion dollars in five years, you would say, oh, that person isn't, you know, isn't going to make it, you know, and typically those persons were men that would come in with these inflated projections, right? That's a very masculine, very assertive way to present data in my mm -hmm. mind, overconfident. Whereas women would tend to come in with very thoughtful, deliberate, you know, calculated numbers, much more conservative. And there was a bias against that. And in my point, my, my you know, stepping mm -hmm. back now, why is that seen as negative? we should want an entrepreneur who is very thoughtful and careful and understands what growth may actually be versus one that's coming in selling a whole bunch of lies, right? And this is where the Elizabeth Holmes um, story is really interesting because she did a lot of those classic, what we value in entrepreneurship, right? This very masculine male normative model, mm -hmm. over aggressive, deep voice, right? Decisiveness, being in charge. Um, showing projections and, um, you know, promises that may not be able to be fulfilled. And that's not a good way to be, right? That, that isn't something we should be valuing. So the whole norms that we've established aren't ones that I think we should be valuing. And so, you know, Venki just said, you want to do a pitch session. Unfortunately, you still have to train people to pitch in that way because this is these are the biases that we're overvaluing as investors so yeah, <laughs> so. yeah okay thanks um, so there is another question from Maheshwari Srinivasan which I'll probably ask on her behalf um, so she's just posted in the chat box did you do any study on medical device manufacturing industry I am a woman no. entrepreneur. How should I overcome this bias? Ah, okay. So uh, two good questions. So I haven't done research on the medical device industry itself. I used one of those um, companies just as my shell company for you know for the study, just to say because it did receive venture capital funding. Um, what I can tell you is that in the sciences, we know that women are outpacing men, right? In, in med schools in the US, there are more women in, in, in biology degrees, et cetera. We are seeing you know, parity or um, over parity, frankly. Um, but, and we're not seeing that play out in the investment realm when it comes to startups in biology or in the science sector. 
That changes, however, once the company gets bigger. And so from my uh, research of the private equity investments, we did find that more women-led businesses um, got later stage funding. So there were more women getting funding in the private equity or, or later stage venture capital um, levels. And I, I personally think that's because women are getting into those roles, into those CEO roles later, as opposed to getting the startup funding. So whether or not they're starting businesses, I don't know that. Um, that's a different question. But so, yeah. So I, I haven't studied the industry specifically, but I would say we are seeing more women getting later stage funding in healthcare related businesses. So, right. and yes. Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Is there yeah. anything you'd like to add? Oh, no, I just I just saw this question and I wanted to take it because. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yes. right. So Vidula asked, you know, what can we do to make a dent in this masculine understanding? And this is where uh, I, I love this question because this is something I've been thinking about a lot. And I had on my slide, you know, and I, I kind of uh, pointed out to all of you that even you know, your own advisory board is all men. And I think we need to be very deliberate in terms of the examples that you use in the classroom and the success stories that you are showing and the models of entrepreneurship. And so, you know, when I look back at the entrepreneurship classes I've taught and I, you know, the models, the examples that we use are all men, right? And all white men to that as well. And so bringing in examples of different people to show the different paths and the different success stories or the different ways entrepreneurship is enacted is one, right? So a diverse set of role models of case studies, but also being very deliberate in who is making those decisions, even in your own organization. And so making sure to have um, women or other, you know, kind of uh, other, other people, um, part of the conversation in terms of setting the, the classroom norms. And so, you know, to make sure you understand to show that, you know, Sarah Blakely of Spanx, you know, wasn't able to raise venture capital and still has the most valuable company, you know, in the, in the country, fastest growing in fact. And, you know, and just uncovering some of these behavioral norms and, and evaluating, is this a good quality to have? We're telling you to go pitch aggressively, assertively to say that your project, your company is going to make a billion dollars in five years, whether or not you believe it doesn't matter. That's what they look for. Is that a good idea, right? Is that really the way to success and who you partner with, right? What kind of partnerships are you making? Who's at the table? All of these things should be um, discussed. Thank you. There is a hand that Navani the Christian has raised. Maybe we will make this as the last question. Um, uh, Navani the Christian, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, uh, Professor uh, Tillay, and uh, good morning, uh, uh, Dr. Lakshmi. Uh, thanks for that interesting uh, presentation. I just wanted to know: Is there any study that has been done comparing the gender uh, survival rates and failure rates between male and uh, uh, female entrepreneur or enterprise. Is there any such comparative studies which has been done? I just wanted yeah. to know your view. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a fabulous question too. So, you know, unfortunately with entrepreneurship and with funding, right, there's so much about the process that while we do research and we're trying to understand what are the qualities that doesn't make this just luck, right? Like what, how can we cl clarify what someone is doing or the steps they're taking to codify it into you know, steps that work. And we, we don't have good data on survival, unfortunately, because as you see, um, whether or not somebody gets funded can be a make or break, but then the level at which you get funded could be a make or break. It also could be, there's a lot of reasons why people don't continue businesses, right? They may they may lose interest, they may lo be losing money, they may you know, um, not be able to continue, they may wanna do something else. So there's lots of reasons why the survival rates are different from, um, from for any business. And so 
when you look at survival of men versus women, one of the critical things that you have to look at in the beginning, in my mind, is were they able to raise capital to push, you know, to enable your business to survive. And that's where we see an enormous gap. And you may have a business that survives, but it may be like these cottage businesses, right? These household businesses that often get dismissed as not being real businesses. And we see a lot more women doing these types of businesses. Um, and I think that's a function of the context, right? Um, and as you saw, even when you have an, a business idea that could be a multi-billion dollar endeavor, something like Spanx or cosmetics, right? We heard about sugar cosmetics, um, they get discounted as being you know, cupcake businesses. I think that is in itself gendered, that there is a, a real um, dismissal of businesses that are uh, women focused as not as considered not being real businesses or having real potential. Um, and that's simply false, right? That's, uh, we know better, but so, sorry, that was a, a side note <laughs> again about the, you know, this ma this masculine norm of entrepreneurship. It, 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 it enters these biases in lots of, lots of different ways. So. Okay. Sorry, Lakshmi, I think uh, in keeping with the, uh, in the, in the theme of this uh, speaker, there is a hand that Mamta has raised. So okay. should we make this last question? Sure. One more, Mamta. <laughs> oh, thank you, Tilay. And Lakshmi, I wanted to know, uh, was this research of yours self-funded or if it was funded, who funded it? That's the most important question I've been thinking of all this while. A wonderful question. Um, so just like entrepreneurs, right? As researchers, we need to find funding. <laughs> and so my work, I did get a couple fellowships for my dissertation work, which was how I was able to fund some of the, the travel and the, and the research to do this. Um, but I know it was, I mean, this was not funded. It was part of my job, right? And this is an area that I'm interested in. I did do we did get a sponsored research um, with Bank of America. And that was that last study I showed you about successful entrepreneurs, uh, successful women entrepreneurs. And the reason they wanted to do the study, I'll be honest with you, is that was part of their private investment arm. So they were looking to get more uh, women involved in investing and, and you know, not in the private capital management. So they're trying to broaden their market of all these women that have been successful. So we did this study, studying successful women entrepreneurs, which I was very interested in doing. And so that, that was sponsored. Um, so that was funded research. But I, this has been work, um, it's been hard to get funding. I'll be honest there too, right? To study the disparity here if you're not doing kind of classic VC, and I, you know, as I mentioned, you know, I know on your board, you know, I, I know Jerry, for example, Jerry George, at, at, uh, who's now at Singapore, and I know a couple of the other professors there. They, I would say, we even bring that norm to our research of just like this. If we study the venture capital industry on its whole, there's a very masculine norm embedded in it of these assumptions that we're making of what's quality and how the industry works. And I, what I'm suggesting to you is that when you try to say, hey, maybe that's not the way it should be, right? That you're trying to push against the status quo, it's hard to raise research funds for it um, because perhaps that's not what they wanna hear. So um, some of it, so most of it was funded through just you know my own research interests. Um, but I did get a couple uh, research grants, both fellowships, you know, from um, I, from program on negotiation at Harvard Law School, uh, Kaufman Foundation, which is a big foundation of entrepreneurship. They funded my dissertation work. I was a grad fellow there, and now, you know, I'm bringing. I feel like I'm bringing my research to federal government because I I won this uh, AAAS fellowship for science and technology policy fellow um, in uh, at the NSF. So, yeah, so I, I think I'm getting, you know, kind of rewarded for the research, but it is definitely not, um, I would say, mainstream, right? Um, and so it can be challenging. <laughs>